Hi there. <coughs> hey, how's it going, Alexis? Hey, Chris. Good to see you. Yeah, we'll get started in a couple minutes. Is uh, is, is Cantrell here? Trying to. Yep, I'm here. Cool. Morning, morning. Alrighty, is uh, <clears throat> is Brian Grant or Camille on the line? Yes. Yeah, good to hear from you, Brian. Uh, Ken Owens or Solomon? I know Ken is supposed to show up, and okay, it looks like Camille just joined, so we're good. We're good to go. All right, Alexis, uh, you want to kick things off? It's about five past. We got Thanks seven. Thanks very much, Chris. I think I'm, I'm, I'm in, still in the process of getting the slides up. But no what would be great is if you could um, just talk us through the process for the TOC uh, re-election. Uh, two. Yeah, sure. sure, sure, no problem. So uh, on slide uh, six, so we've mentioned this in the past that uh, two seats are freeing up on the TOC. These are uh, TOC selected seats. So uh, essentially uh, the TOC themselves votes and nominates um, these seats. So uh, if you're interested in running um, for this, I would highly advise you talk to your fellow TOC members. Um, nominations are opening up today. Uh, the TOC has been nominating some folks. Uh, I plan to close the nominations March 6th. Uh, and then we'll do the voting for about a week. We'll close voting on March 14th and announce the results on, on the 15th. Um, any uh, questions? Uh, these are Brian and Solomon's seat, by the way. Brian Grant and, and Solomon's. And presumably, uh, Brian and Solomon need to be renominated if they are. Yeah. Bri Bri Brian Grant has already expressed interest in being renominated. So I put him on the list. Uh, Solomon has not yet uh, said anything. So please, if you're looking to be nominated, uh, then members of the voting TOC will probably oblige. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd say there's a, an, a relatively low probability of your request for nomination getting rejected. It, it may happen, um, but it's, it is, in, in my view, unlikely. But you do need to be nominated. So if you're interested yeah. in this, don't be ashamed. Throw your hat in the ring now and tell, tell Chris or, or someone else. Yeah. Okay, good. So I think the next topic is the proposed sandbox model, correct, Chris? Yep. Slide seven. Yeah, I'm now in the deck. Great. Cool. So, um, you know, here's what we came up with after the last TOC meeting, where thanks everybody for all of your feedback on the sandbox concept. That was super helpful. And um, we've now got a document, uh, which has largely been written by Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, with some input from the TOC and a few other people, uh, which we would like to move to a vote as soon as we can, maybe not today. Um, has everybody read that proposal? If you haven't, do open it now and have a quick, quick read. It's not, it's not a long document. I don't think it's feasible for us to vote on this today, but I think we can discuss the absolutely most important points. Uh, one of which is that we have an explicit declaration that we're not going to do marketing and there is an attempt to clarify what that means in practice because in reality we are going to do we, we hope to publicize uh, projects in the sandbox so that people know they exist and might want to contribute to them but we want our focus to be around building community rather than you know going around saying this is production ready everybody should start using it right now which is what you would consider normal product marketing so that's one important point. And there's quite a lot of language in the document about uh, playing down expectations here. 
Um, I'm really looking for people to vociferously object to any other language at this point. Secondly, we've tried to come up with a model where the bar to getting into the sandbox is lower than inception. Because one of the issues we ran into that caused uh, what somebody amusingly called storage gate is that there was a perception of blessing or um, election to some elite by being made an inception project. And while we do think that, you know, getting recognition is important, nonetheless, um, we want to kind of take out the idea that there were process similarities between the sandbox and incubation. So for example, we don't want to have a vote. Um, there, will be, there will not be a voting process and a presentation and a document and a vote in order to get something into the sandbox. The, um, the current plan is to have two voting TOC members act as sponsors. So that basically means if you can convince two of the nine people to be on side for your project, then you know that ticks that box. You know, other than that, it's it's all in the document. But uh, I'm now going to open the floor to comment. I think it levels the playing field, so I like the idea of the sandbox better. So with that includes for inception will go away in a sandbox and we won't perform due diligence, right? There will not be due diligence for entry into the sandbox. Hi, this is Bob Wise. Um, this is looking uh, really good. Um, one question, just because I haven't looked through the doc here, which I'll, I'll do shortly. Um, where, where did you land on uh, cross-org contributor uh, requirements for sandboxing? There are no such requirements. Yeah, I don't think it, personally, I don't think it's a good idea to require that. Um, it is part of the whole incubation graduation story and Personally, I'm open to uh, raising the bar for incubation, multi-companies contributing and things. But I think that we need to be super careful not to create perverse incentives at the very earliest stages. Right, just, just to be clear, I, given the sandbox, uh, lowering the bar for the sandbox, I, I think that's the right call. It wasn't, I wasn't advocating for one position, I was just looking for clarity on. on what okay, I'm... understood, thanks Bob. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, sorry for all the questions. Uh, what will happen to projects that are in inception? Um, I haven't gone through the doc thoroughly enough. To right, know. it'll move into the sandbox. It'll move sandbox, okay, perfect. Or graduate. To or graduate, thank you, yes, good point. In, in terms of the sandbox exit requirements, is there an exit where it will move out of the CNCF as well? Chris, why don't you take that one? Right, 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 right now, no. The only exit is just being archived, put in the uh, attic, Apache attic now. Uh, is there a question mark? It does. I, I, I guess my, my main motivation for, for that is when I saw things like donating uh, the trademarks, et cetera, yep. to the CNCF. You know, because of the five hundred one c three, yep, uh, it has exit requirements for you can't move it back out. And so Correct. I was just curious about, you know, if a sandbox project was not successful inside the CNCF, but someone else wanted to take it out external, what would that look like? And I'm not saying that would happen. I'm just trying, yeah. trying to poke at the edges of this. Yeah, I mean, probably case by case basis, like if for some reason something failed and wanted to move to another open source foundation, we could potentially do something there. But I, I treat it as a case by case type basis. Do those trademarks actually need to be transferred when entering uh, the sandbox? We discussed not doing that for inception and maybe even incubation. Uh, we're, we've decided to require it. Um, I think it's a little bit more defensible for us, but uh, it's, it's up to the TOC. Um, but the licensing terms are um, pretty liberal, so people yep. can just fork the project also. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And are we going to create any rigid 
uh, rigid's maybe the wrong word timelines around this i mean or could a, you know something be in the, will we have a timeline for the sandbox before we it would come up for a vote for archiving or it doesn't seem like we have good criteria on terms of timelines of these, like after a year, after six months, or after three months, there's an evaluation period. Uh, there's annual reviews, if you look at the diagram for everything. So that's kind of a timeline. There's no forced timeline in terms of how long you have to stay in, in the sandbox. It could be infinite. Okay. Or it could be shorter, it could be six months. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it could be. Three months, who knows, right? But there's no forced timeline for, um, you know, graduation or moving to the next level. Um, there's just an annual review from, from the projects. Okay. So one, one thing that might be missing inside the diagram is, um, is that, and I think we, this is verbally described down below, but is the notion that um, projects are still encouraged to be um, reviewed initially at an incubation level, um, but, you know, they, they might find themselves going through a sandbox first. If for the lazy reader, those that just draw their eyes to the diagram initially might consider that the sandbox is, is the only path to incubation. Uh, although it also, I mean, it also implies pretty strongly that it is the, the preferable path to incubation. So, I, I mean, I, I would want us to be steering most projects towards the sandbox, making yeah. exceptions for projects that are ready for immediate incubation. So sorry, what's the intent there? Because I think Brian and I have got slightly different um, perceptions of it. I, I mean, I, I don't, um, Brian, how strongly do you feel that the, that the or how frequent do you think it'll be that, that projects skip the sandbox and go to incubation? Well, I think we're still um, in the process of discovering existing open source projects uh, mm -hmm. that are more mature. Uh, well, we're, the reason for the sandbox is that we're also entering a phase with the, where there are a lot more uh, early stage projects being started and developed. Uh, so I think that shift will continue to occur over time. Um, but I don't think we're completely, we've completely discovered all of the uh, more mature projects yet. So maybe do we want to put some language in the doc to, to that effect that the, the, the projects um, that will uh, will be potential candidates for not being in the sandbox, going straight to incubation, are those that have matured outside of the CNCF? Uh, sure. I mean, I, we, what I'm trying to do is I would like to avoid a the stigmatizing the sandbox such that everyone wants to wants to skip straight to incubation and effectively right. back in the same problem. This is Alexis speaking. Do you have this is going to. Uh, this isn't meant to be as rude as it sounds. Have you read the document? Because there is some language about this. Yeah, I think Brian and I both read the document. I was quoting from the document. Okay, so it, the document tries to be explicit that there's two things. One is that the the process is not discriminatory, meaning that the TOC will not favor projects from the sandbox just because they're in the sandbox when it comes to incubation, but also two that the re one of the reasons you should be in the sandbox is to get to incubation faster because you know the idea is that these are things that are supposed to help people get there. And if that's not clear, I would like to make it clearer in the document. I do agree though that we don't want to disadvantage projects in the sandbox. So I've made a comment about this with regards to, um, I forget, some other, some other issue. So we do, we do want to be careful that they're not disadvantaged, that the projects couldn't do things that they would normally be able to do to, to grow and thrive outside the same box. Okay. Where's your comment, Brian? I'm trying to find it. Uh, it may have been resolved. Yeah. Okay. Oops. I think it's under the governance and benefits section. Okay. Well, I would welcome more contributions to this document, quite frankly. I feel, feel that Chris and I have got it as far as we can together and it needs a few more people to have a look just to get it over the line. Part of the reason that I uh, raised my voice earlier to ask about um, or to highlight the notion that folks who are just looking toward the diagram might consider that sandbox is the, is sort of the, the only way in is, is back to Brian Grant's point. Like we, we've been uh, here at SolarWinds, we've been doing a fair bit of work with uh, Intel's uh, SNAP and, 
and considering where where its home might might be and um and, and, and that that project itself is probably you know probably most appropriately considered as something of an incubation and so um good that we've got we've got clarity around the notion that sandbox isn't isn't the only path toward incubation that there are to brian grant's point other other open source projects that are probably at a maturity level that don't start there it is however the preferred path Brian, do you want to suggest some some language for the document? Alex, I'm not sure to, to, to whom you're speaking, but the, the, I think the Brian Grant's concern was just that that, that the diagram was overly prescriptive. Okay, I would yeah. be happy to use the diagram, or we could um, yeah introduce the direct arrow into the incubation stage. And uh, yeah, I'll try to find some time to propose some language somewhere in the document. Yeah. And if we do that, I just want to reinforce some of the language that's already there about the sandbox really being the, the, the preferred path. Um, it, it's not obvious to me, for example, that Intel Snap would be a candidate necessary for direct incubation. Because I, 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 I think we all want to, uh, to get ourselves out of the problem of where we are adjudicating a bunch of projects that are relatively small projects and relatively new projects that we don't think are insignificant. But that, that's the problem we at the, at the TOC are trying to solve. And I don't want to recreate that problem by implying that everybody should be going straight to incubation. So if we're going to modify the diagram, to, I think we should. I just think we want to establish what, some pretty clear um, rules of thumb in terms of wh what kinds of projects would go straight to incubation. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I think we do that. To the the the, the outlining incubation criteria is very helpful in terms of where what kind of expecting. Okay, and that that still applies. We'll we'll update it as soon as we finalize the sandbox criteria. Yeah, and I think maybe if you update the diagram, just point to the later in the document where we talk about the exit criteria. Basically, like if yeah. you're going to go straight to incubation, you really need to have already satisfied the exit criteria. Yeah, got it. So here, here's another request to to the people on the call, which is, if there's something about the document that you f do you just feel isn't quite right or um, could be improved, but you're not quite sure what language to propose, please do try and articulate your question or, or your doubt on the public. CNCF TOC list, and I promise to spend some time, or Chris or both of us, just trying to craft some language to reflect your concern. Comment in the doc or on the list. <clears throat> if you put it in the doc, that's fine as well, yeah. uh, okay. or in the um, in the list. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. So, Alexis, you were concerned that this was not ready for a vote. Um, out of curiosity, what are some of the big gaps that you still see? Because this, to me, looks pretty good. Um, I mean, mo modulus, some minor things. What are some of the big holes that you're seeing? I didn't think there were big holes. I just felt that we might have got some of the tone wrong. Uh, we might have overlooked a couple of key points that we have an opportunity now to include uh, rather than, so I, I just was predicting that we probably would just need a bit more time uh, before we actually voted on it. And uh, I reckon, however, that having listened to what people said on the call today, that it is feasible to get further edits done, um, let's say by this time next week, and then maybe call a vote on the email list rather than on the call. Yep. Yep. Is that a reasonable schedule? Yep. Okay. All right, so let's do that. So once again, for those who are listening, um, you've got one week to, to voice concerns, doubts, or make comments, and we will try to get them all reflected in roughly this time next week, Tuesday, which is obviously not a, not a TOC call. And then we will uh, agree informally to call a vote on the document without requesting soliciting input, further input from you. We'll just call a vote and we'll get plus ones or not based on people's uh, position. And if we don't get it over the line, we'll, we'll continue editing it. I think that makes perfect sense. Thanks. All righty. Oh, okay, what's next? 
project proposals. Um, call for a uh, few, few more TOC contributors. I'm basically happy with the NATS proposal at this point. Um, I'm just looking for a few more external idols. My pr primary worry with NATS was that um, people who were not familiar with messaging might have a whole bunch of questions about it. So it's really crucial that the other people who volunteered to help, like uh, Quinton, uh, Lockie, and others, could, could go and take a quick look and just make sure they're happy and anyone else. And I believe the same is true for OPA and Spiffy. Yeah, just to be clear, this is Quinton. Um, we had a bunch of Huawei messaging people look over the dock. Uh, it may not be clear based on the names that might be unfamiliar, but yes, the, the stuff I plan to do has been done. Great. And all, Great. The, all the OPA feedback um, has been incorporated as well, I believe. So I think OPA is ready to move forward. If there's anything I'm missing there, just you can pull it to my attention offline if you want. Great. What do you think of this? Sounds good, but I'm holding uh, votes until we finalize the sandbox stuff. Okay. Um, and I had quite a few comments in the Google Doc that don't look like they made it into the PR. Are we going to have a more consistent? We're going to start with the PR, so we're capturing everything there. Are we still going to continue to start in a Google Doc? It just seems like some of the conversation is <laughs> lost when we move from one to the next. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good point. We should probably make sure we, For, we uh, use the Google Doc because it's easier. We should at least copy the conversation over the PR window. Yeah. 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 I think in most past cases, we moved the uh, document over to a PR at an earlier stage before broad comment. The Google Docs were mostly as a way just to have the collaborators on the proposal um, assemble the, the full proposal together yeah. and then, mm -hmm. then move it to a PR for general comment. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think in, in the Nats case, uh, it, it was kind of distributed broadly before it was complete and, and that caused some yeah. complications. So apologies, Aaron, for the confusion, but we'll try not to uh, be as confusing next time. I just want to make sure nothing was missed in terms of, I mean, there's quite a lot of conversation within the doc. Yeah. It doesn't look like it got transferred into the PR. Um, well, you know, you're very welcome to review it and put some stuff in the PR, but I think okay. hopefully someone's going to have to do that. Yep. Okay. I'll go back through and, and if it hasn't been addressed properly in the PR, I'll add those comments back in. Thank you. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just you, but if you could take responsibility for it and then call up the NATS people, Derek, Peter and others, and just let them know what, that you're doing this, then I'm sure they'll help you. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Project review backlog. Chris, what are we doing about this? Yeah. So there's two things here. One is uh, we kind of have our annual review. So Corey DNS is going to speak a little bit uh, later in the call about what's going on in the past year. Uh, we have a couple of projects, uh, in particular Prometheus, Kubernetes. Um, I believe the steering committee has recently decided that they're okay moving forward to graduate. So there's a proposal uh, from them kind of in their back burner to issue a PR um, to us. That'll, I don't know if Quentin happen this week. Uh, could speak. Okay, awesome, fantastic. So from our perspective, uh, if the Kubernetes PR comes in, I'm fine um, holding a vote over email for graduating um, a few of our projects that have already submitted proposals, depending on how the TOC feels comfortable. I think both uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus are fairly uh, mature and well-baked. Um, you know, they were our first two projects, so I'm uh, pretty confident they're good to go. Uh, but it's really up for you to kind of decide how you want to do this. I'm in favor of uh, a vote soon yeah. if nobody has concerns about those two specific projects. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in agreement. And once, once we get the uh, PR sent, we can notify the mailing list so people can look over. And if there's information that yep. it was missing for making the decision, that would be helpful to work out at this stage since these are the first couple to graduate. Yep. But, I mean, essentially the projects are self-declaring 
that they are ready for graduation and, and have met the criteria. Yep. And then they are evidencing that, that self-declaration in the PR. Cor correct. So we are expecting them to request support for their declaration. Essentially, that is what the vote yep. is. Yep. Right. And yeah, so, so in the Kubernetes proposal, for example, it will include links to uh, the information that demonstrates that we've met the criteria on, yeah. a, on a bullet by bullet basis. Yeah. The Prometheus one already did that. So. Okay. So if any of these projects have any time constraints, I know that from time to time, um, people like to announce things. There are requests about, you know, conferences coming up and so forth. Uh, do make sure that you let Chris know privately if you have worries about any of this uh, or if it's okay on the public list, that's fine too. But we, we should move promptly now on these things. Yep. Sounds good. I'll, uh, I'll wait for the Kubernetes PR and then uh, I'll send a reminder to the mailing list for any further review and then hopefully call a vote maybe um, late next week. Yeah. All right. So working group updates now. Um, Ken, do you want to congratulate the serverless working group on releasing their 1.0 stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That was a um, both, I think, an interesting um, approach to um, to how a work group could have an output in the CNCF. And so I, I want to first of all, you know, congratulate the, the service work group uh, for the hard work that was put into the reference architecture, and we did ship that already. We also, as you can see on this slide, we put in a, um, a landscape as well, and. The landscape is um, maybe not as um, I'm, I'm not as big of a fan of the landscape as I am the white paper, but I think it's it's good to try to start defining um, within the the framework of the white paper that we developed what sort of projects um, fit within there. And so um, the next step to step out of this is two things. Um, one, we're still thinking there might be interest to bring forward some of these projects to the CNCF for incubation or for um, uh, sandbox, once that gets ra um, ratified, assuming that they are cloud native um, in, in scope and, and function. So, and then the second thing is we started working on a cloud event spec, um, which is sort of an attempt to, as you guys know, um, events are collected and, and managed in many different ways across every single cloud provider and every infrastructure today. So we're trying to come up with a kind of a, an event, um, event master of all events, if you will, to kind of um, let you feed in your events into, um, into a common uh, framework for event manage management across multiple environments. So. Um, once we get that to the point where we're ready to bring it to the TLC for review, we will do that. Um, Doug, I know you're on the cause. Anything you want to add to to the white paper, to the um, cloud event spec? Nope, I think you covered it very well. Thank you. Doug has done a really great job of helping us move this forward. So I want to thank Doug uh, personally for the, for the yeah, assistance. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Driving this. And also thanks for everybody else, Ken, especially Yaron and others who put work into this. Um, Sarah too. And Sarah, and Sarah. I have a request about this cloud events, which is that, you know, some of you may have, may have noticed that uh, Kelsey Hightower has been um, doing quite a lot of uh, tweeting about serverless in the last week or two and did an interesting kind of deep dive review on OpenWhisk on uh, IBM's Bluemix platform and talked a bit about the event APIs. And it would be good to show Kelsey some of this work if he hasn't seen it and see if he, as a member of the community, can comment, because I think it's important that people see this work as useful, and if it's not useful, we need to make it more useful. So now that we have documents to show people, let's get them in front of people. Yeah, I can definitely do that. And the second thing, I, I wanna ask people uh, on the TOC call, you know, do you think this is the kind of work that the working groups should be doing? Is this? at least for first base, satisfactory as a set of deliverables for working groups, because I know that we haven't quite figured out exactly uh, what level of empowerment should be given to individual working groups around TOC stuff, and we're still, that's something we need to figure out soon. Uh, does this serverless working group represent a success here? What are people's thoughts on this? I 
Actually, this is Doug. I have, a, I have a question. Ken mentioned earlier the our working group coming back to the TOC for review or, or something like that later on. At what point in our life cycle would the TOC like us to come back? Do they want us to come back just periodically? Do they want us to ping the TOC when we feel like we've made significant progress? Do we want to wait for 1.0 of the spec? What kind of time frame are you guys looking for? Well, I think that, that the working group should report to the TOC, you know, sporadically every you know, one to three months. It doesn't need to be regular, but I think what's really critical is that the working groups define their own roadmap exit criteria, success criteria, and essentially act as a project and say, this is what we want to do next. When, when that is done, we will declare victory and then we may have future work or not, but uh, you know, our primary objective is to do this. And then maybe the working group could be you know, shelved for a while or it could get a new objective. But it has to come up from the group. It has to be specified. These are the objectives that we want to fulfill. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And does the TLC need to approve of our stated objectives or as long as they're within the scope of our original sort of charter, is that okay? I think I wouldn't say so far as, you know, there has to be a presentation with a vote and approvals, but I think provided you're socializing your objectives and any significant changes regularly on the main TOC public list, uh, so that people are aware of them and have an opportunity to, you know, viscerally object, then I think you're doing the right things. I wouldn't, you know, look for explicit support necessarily. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Okay. To answer your earlier question, uh, I, I think that the, the white paper that was published by the uh, serverless working group is super useful just for uh, kind of getting everyone on the same page about terminology and direction, et cetera, for a given field. Uh, so I, I would encourage that as a good starting model for other working groups too. Good. I was also just going to comment that I think that it is really highly valuable to have a venue for to discuss the interoperability concerns between projects. I mean, I think we're still converging on, you know, kind of effective process around the serverless working group, but certainly it's, you know, instead of each project having one off conversations with other projects to figure out how they're interoperable, having a working group who's focused on that domain help facilitate that conversation. I think, um, you know, I don't, really see another place for that so i think that's good thank you all right okay ken could you talk about the reference architecture slide please and the subsequent logical architecture yeah so um this is something that um when we on the left hand side of this slide is our existing um in user reference architecture and just to kind of remind um the TLC members and the you know whoever might be new to this TLC call. We, when the work group formed, I guess it was or I'm sorry, the foundation formed a couple of years ago. Now we had this um, um, reference architecture in the scoping document, and we find it kind of felt like it wasn't really the right reference architecture, and so there was a request to update the reference architecture, and so that's that's what we came up with on the left hand side there that we announced at I think KubeCon in. Um, Sorry, am I the only one who can't see the presented screen? <laughs> oh, it's, oh it's, I'm, just, I'm just going off the slide, the slides that were sent out, yeah. slide 13. Gotcha, sorry. Yeah, I'm yep, not sure. Slide 13, 14. Sorry. <laughs> um, and so on, on slide 13, um, the left-hand side picture there is our current end-user reference architecture. And when we, when we put this together, um, the idea was this was supposed to be kind of a high level reference architecture, not meant to be technical and not meant to be very specific or detailed. Um, and we decided, you know, discussed the need to kind of get to the next level of detail, which I'm kind of calling a logical architecture that that might not be the right name. And I'm, I'm happy changing names at any time. So um, the, this was a, a proposal I worked with, um, with an interesting member from, from the call we had last week or two weeks ago, um, he reached out to me and said, Hey, let's, I like the idea of taking it to the next level. And here's what I've been thinking about. And, um, in other discussions I've had over the last couple of years, control and observe and optimize seem to be kind of a key theme, um, that keeps coming up over and over again. And so, um, as you kind of look at the different components or the different functions that make up, um, kind of a cloud native reference architecture, 
you get these sort of boxes and there might be missing a box here that I'm not, I'm not trying to say this is the proposal. This is just sort of a high level diagram. And we go down to the next slide, slide 14. If you kind of take, you know, kind of monitoring service communication orchestration as sort of the three main components of a reference architecture that gets to the more technical level, pretty much all the other components have to map to those three um, logical components, right? And so um, we're kind of thinking this is now, there now seems to be some interest in taking this forward and looking at what would be the next level of detail below that end user reference architecture that we have for the CNCF. Um, this seems like a good starting point. I put a couple of our projects in there already that, that we have um, in this, which I should probably put Prometheus. I just didn't have time to add Prometheus to this, so apologies to, to Prometheus not being on here. But um, you know, I think this sort of helps define that next level of detail. And, and the point of this discussion was to say, um, there seems to be interest in, in doing something here. Um, I'm willing to help sort of lead that discussion and, and schedule some meetings to kind of come up with a, a reference, I mean, the next level of detail below the reference architecture. Um, I'm, I'm asking for additional volunteers to be interested in joining that effort and then we would obviously come back to the to this working group, um, you know, every two weeks with an update whenever we get to something that is makes sense to the feedback. Um, and so the idea here was, I, I don't think I need to create a working group. We could, but I'm, I'm almost thinking this is almost like a work stream outside, or, you know, part of the TOC effort, but not a work group within the TOC, but I'm happy to, to make it a work group if that seems to be the right approach to, to work on this next level of detail that's needed. Yeah, Ken, I, I do think that the iterations on this are very helpful. I think that as you played them out over time, you'd almost you'd almost say that we do have a work stream for this today, and it's it's the landscapes. Like if you imagine what these take, take the shape of as they play out, it it, it may become kind of one and the same. Right. Um, you know, one intentionally, you know, what, you know, the, the two starting from different places. One more from a technical perspective on capabilities and how do they interact and overlap, and what a description of what those capabilities are as versus the landscape being, you know, well, it's the what right way for a, anyway, I think they arrive at the same place as well. As well. Yeah. yeah, the landscape work started out of that reference architecture it has some of the same like categories of boxes, right? And then it broke down into a little bit more detail. And so I, I do think there is definitely a um, alignment with this next level of detail and, and the reference and the landscape for sure. Okay, so I think um, the next action is to continue as you have been, and we'll treat it similar to the uh, cloud native definition document, where a small group of people who are dedicated to spending time on this work quickly to come up with some more fleshed out ideas without going as far as calling it a working group, and then um, present that to the TOC, and then if we feel there's, you know, justification for creating a working group subsequently, we can do that. But uh, let's see if we can avoid creating a working group. Perfect. Perfect. I would do that. And um, I have, um, there's an issues, um, in the, there's a, I was, there's, I think, look in the, um, not this isn't just to me, if it's sent to everyone, but uh, Chris, thanks for setting up that um, um, issues. Yeah. Yeah, just do it from there. Call people to participate through the GitHub issue and, and we could start from there. Yep. It's a good idea. Thank just you. If you're interested in, in being involved, please join the discussion there. Cool. Thank you very much. So, shall we move on to the Core DNS annual, annual review? Yeah, is, is John on the call? Yes, I'm here. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? Thank you. All right, um, I'm John Delmer, I'm one of the maintainers of Core DNS, and uh, just to talk a little bit about what we've been up to for the last year. Uh, we can go to slide 16. Um, so it's been a pretty good year for us. We've uh, grown a lot, our community, and um, one, of the, one of the things we're, we're really pleased with is that um, we put in a proposal to become the default DNS for Kubernetes. 
um, and we're on track for that. It's not, it's not uh, in GA yet, but um, we're alpha in 1.9. We should be coming out as beta in 1.10, and we're hoping to, to GA that in 1.11. Um, I've talked to folks from a number of the different um, managed or uh, other Kubernetes distributions, and uh, everybody there uh, I've talked to is planning on um, moving uh, their, their cluster DNS to core DNS in their distribution or their our managed, uh, managed service. So that's going well. We have um, a lot of growth in our Docker polls, 2.5 million polls as of this morning. Um, and uh, more and more uh, people contributing, especially we've grown the contributors um, from the non-maintainers contributing. So we have, uh, if you recall Core DNS, one of our things is we have a pluggable architecture and so we've got a number of non-maintainers and, and people building their own plugins for their own purposes. And um, we call those external plugins, which, we, which are hosted in their own repositories and we provide a reference from our, our, our website on them. But um, had a bunch of those built this year. And um, we do have uh, in our uh, adopters file, we have uh, seven public production users, although there's others we've talked to um, who aren't on the file, but uh, like SoundCloud, for instance, runs several hundred Corbinus instances. And uh, they told me I could, could say it on the call, but uh, they haven't gotten the file yet. Um, this is our an annual review. As part of that, we can go to slide 17. We are looking to, um, to graduate to incubated uh, status. And so we have, as uh, was mentioned earlier, we have a PR out there for that. Um, we do meet all the criteria as they're laid out there. Um, and uh, so I hope that uh, we'll be able to, to have that vote soon. Um, that's all I've really got. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Okay, um, Chris, any process steps that we should be aware of? Yeah, so, uh, you know, per the charter, we're supposed to review um, inception projects on an annual basis, uh, but it also, John is requesting to move to incubation. So we have a choice. We could uh, try to lump those things together and uh, just do a vote over the mailing list or separate them out. I'm not sure what the TOC prefers. It seems a little bit uh, redundant to kind of do both since they'll be so close to each other. How do you feel about this one? Sorry, the question is, should it be incubation or wait to yep. stay in the box? I, I think incubation is fine. I think the original question around core DNS, uh, which I think was voiced by Camille and Brian Cantrill was, you know, small one person team, not quite ready for use yet. Just it seems a little bit early, but I feel that yeah. uh, it's got past all of the points it needed to and, and is now, you know, a full fledged project. And we should be very, very happy to make it incubation and possibly graduation. If there's no strong objections, I'm fine uh, calling a vote for it to uh, move to incubation. Uh, and to me, that will basically uh, nullify us having to do the annual inception review. We'll just move straight up to incubation. <coughs> Sounds great to me, Chris. <laughs> There's no strong objections. I'll, uh, I'll do it. Uh, I'll call a vote this week. Yeah, let's go. All right, next item. I think we've just got enough time to do Rex Ray, but I'm still a bit confused about, um, is this applying for incubation or inception slash sandbox now? Incubation is, is what we'd like to have it as. Excellent. Um, well, take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you guys for having me again in TSC presenting on a, a storage topic. Uh, I think to set some context on slide 19, uh, it's important to note that Rexray has been presented, it was about a year and a half ago that we brought it to the TOC. Uh, following that, we also presented uh, lib storage, which is really kind of the semantic layer of Rexray, the, the base uh, implementation layer for storage features. Uh, in the meantime, when those two things happened, you know, there was an S SWG that was formed by the TOC to 
investigate storage storage related things because I think it was generally a, a new topic for the TOC. Uh, and then as well, there was a, a group formed called the, the CSI group, which were from the container orchestrators that were all trying to solve you know, similar challenges that both Rexray and Lib Storage were trying to solve. Uh, and I think you guys know the detail that you know, CSI has been, um, uh, has released to 0.1 at this point. So there, there is now a, a base level of, you know, contract between container orchestrators uh, and storage providers uh, that works. So this, this idea that, you know, what we're communicating on slide 19 is that, hey, there's, there's challenges in the ecosystem. You know, Rexray Live Storage has been trying to address them for the last few years. Uh, there's definitely community momentum built around things. Uh, and there's, there's more work to do. So on, on slide 20, uh, you know, as we move on from the, the problem statement, you know, the, the ecosystem is still fragmented today. Uh, you know, you've got multiple interfaces out there. You know, CSI has been adopted by, by Kubernetes uh, and also by, uh, by Mesos and soon to be by Cloud Foundry. Uh, so there is momentum in like moving the right direction but there's still plenty of work to do to make sure that we don't continue to have this fragmented ecosystem. Uh, you know, from a Kubernetes perspective, uh, it's been communicated that the internal volume plugins that Kubernetes has, are, are they're looking to eject them from the code base and they're looking to replace them with these CSI pl plugins. But one of the questions becomes like, how does that happen? What's the process and, and you know, what, what's it gonna take? And I believe pretty strongly that you know, there's in building these plugins and making you know really good CSI implementations. There's a, a a bunch of common code or redundant efforts that all these plugin maintainers uh, have to deal with, uh, and you know it's very important for them to be accepted and replace the existing plugins that are inside of Kubernetes. That this experience uh, for for the operators needs to be really good, uh, and, and I think that in order to get there. Right. It's going to take some type of a framework uh, where we can have collaboration among you know, the storage plugin providers uh, to make sure we minimize redundant code, ensure a great user experience. Uh, and that's, that, I think, is one of what we need to get to to make these operators trust these CSI plugins and to get to where CSI is, is accepted as more of the industry standard. Uh, on, on slide 21, you know, I feel that, that Rexray is a great fit for this category to provide a, a place in a project for the industry to, to collaborate on uh, as a CSI plugin implementation. So it is, it's, its job is pretty simple, right? He's going to help in developing the plugins uh, so that you can provide, so it can provide uh, a certain set of this common functionality to all the plugins that are developed. So from a, uh, from a cloud native consumer perspective, the value is that there should be better user experiences with the plugins that are developed using this framework. Uh, and so the users are going to be trusting these uh, implementations and will be using CSI uh, quicker. Uh, from a provider and operator experience, uh, th these are people that are actually going to be deploying the Kubernetes clusters or other cluster orchestrators. Uh, you know, they're going to have a pretty seamless uh, deployment experience. So they're going to have consistent configuration, consistent packaging. Uh, they're not going to have to, you know, read a lot of documentation every time they pick up a new CSI plugin. Uh, from a, a storage company or storage project perspective, right, they're going to be able to implement the, the basics of what CSI defines or the basics of what their storage platform needs to be CSI compatible. Uh, and then after that, they're going to get a bunch of features and, and integrations for free. So it should be the, you know, the lowest friction path uh, to creating a CSI plugin for them. Additionally, there's going to be interoperability that's provided for backwards compatibility. So in this ecosystem, you know, the storage companies need to focus on a bunch of different uh, integration points. And that doesn't end just today. Uh, just because CSI came out, they still need to maintain compatibility against existing integration points. And so you know, one of the other things that Rex3 can provide is this interoperability layer. So as you build a CSI plugin, right, you're, all, you're actually compatible with you know, Docker's existing volume interface uh, through that interoperability layer. So a few key points as to why storage companies or projects would be interested in, in collaborating on this kind of project. Uh, Rexray's already got a ton of existing integrations. So as a framework, uh, it's got up to 15 different integrations that it ships with today. On slide 22, we're highlighting the, the existing user experience with something like Docker that Rexray provides uh, for all of the storage platforms that it, it has integrations for. 
Uh, so here you're seeing AWS, GCE, Ceph, like you know, a bunch of different platforms that are all very common. And when someone goes to use a managed plugin through Docker today, uh, you know, they go and they have a single command through Docker that goes and deploys, configures, and, and gets a, a plugin up and running. And it's, it's that kind of user experience that I think is going to be very, very important uh, to deliver to someone who's going to be using this CSI plugins. And, and the, the, you know, the, the situation becomes a little bit more complex in C, the CSI world because in, in that space, I, the COs may have different packaging and they may have different you know, methods of get, getting the things up and running. Uh, so Rexray can really fill that void to, to provide value uh, at the CO level. On, on slide 23, you know, I think it's, you, know, you may be kind of scratching your head at a certain point saying like, hey, I thought that CSI is going to solve you know, the, the fragmentation problem in the ecosystem completely. And you know, the reality is that there's, there's many different layers of code. Uh, and there's, many, there's a lot of things that you would consider redundant and common across some of these layers. And so what we're trying to communicate on slide 23 is, you know, here's the different pieces and here's where Rexray exactly fits in. So first of all, you've got the CSI spec that, you know, is great, defines that contract between a, a storage provider and a cluster orchestrator. Uh, and then because of gRPC, you have your CSI API bindings, which make it, you know, somewhat easier to implement. Uh, but then you have to start implementing and like, you know, enforcing what the contract says uh, within your code. Uh, you've also got to validate kind of end-to-end -end that the spec actually works as it's supposed to. So above the CSI blindings are, you know, on this you see it below, but there's these implementation libraries that are emerging that the community is starting to work through and, uh, and collaborate on. And one of those being Go CSI, and there's others, especially a part of the Kubernetes implementation. Uh, and, and those are really specific for, hey, if I'm implementing CSI, these are the, the much needed things that help me, that are defined by the spec, that help me create a basic plugin. And that might be boilerplate club code, it might be logging, configuration. Uh, where, where CSI really comes, or where Rexray really comes into play, you know, in this perspective, is that it's gonna help bring to the table what's not defined in the interface spec. Uh, maybe that's the CO specific packaging. Maybe that's the, the documentation that helps you understand how it runs with the CO. Maybe it's end-to-end -end CICD and deployment and you know, artifact handling for, for any of the, the plugins. Uh, aside from that, you've got things that are important to people who want to take up these plugins. Maybe that's the handling availability, scale, security, you know, lots of other stuff. Uh, additionally, you know, there's CNCF projects that are important for these plugins to create a great like, cloud-native experience. Uh, so maybe it's integration to etcd, fluentd, jaeger, like any of those projects that all requires code. So, so Rexray is really meant to handle the, the things that are not in the CSI spec, but are important for creating a great user experience uh, with these plugins. So how does that look like in terms of how we create this native CSI plugin? Uh, you know, the, the message is, you know, you build a, a, a native CSI driver, and Rexray's backend is any of these native CSI drivers. So focus on the key platform capabilities that, that you need within your CSI driver, uh, and you, you ship that as a, a Go package, and then Rexray actually uses these CSI drivers as its backend and provides all the extra value adds and, and feature functionality that I've been describing. So it's a native CSI plugin wait, implementation. Wait, wait question. Who is you referring to in, uh, in those statements? Uh, anybody who's building drivers or who's a storage project or platform that wants to be relevant within the CSI ecosystem. Okay, so storage people. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's three audiences. One is you know, the, the end users who really shouldn't know much about CSI. They just know that they have their you know, platform supported. You've got your operators who are just deploying these and the operators care about a great user experience from you know, how they actually get these plugins up and running. And then the other audience is the, um, the storage providers and projects want to be relevant in CSI. So this slide is speaking to, well, how do I build a driver? You know, what is it about this native CSI implementation framework that Rexray provides? So as a, as a project, uh, Rexray has been on a pretty steady release cycle since 2015. Uh, this is slide 25. Uh, so we've had about 78 releases. 
uh, activity wise, uh, pretty consistent uh, uh, repo activity, whether it's the, the events generated through GitHub or whether it's the, the downloads you know, through Bintray or Docker Hub. So very steady um, uh, amount of demand for the project. Clint. On slide six, uh, 26, we speak to the, the collaborators and pull requests. So uh, in addition to the you know, downloads, kind of on the other side of it, we've had plenty of uh, collaborators and pull requests that have, have gone through the project in a pretty steady amount over the past couple of years. I, I expect that you know, Rexray's importance in the ecosystem is gonna increase dramatically at this point. Uh, you know, as of two, two years ago, three years ago, or actually when it started, it was really a Docker project for managed plugins. And you know, as CSI has emerged, it's now become relevant to uh, to everything. And especially, you know, as Kubernetes starts ejecting these these drivers, right? Then it's even going to be more important. Uh, and so, tracking wise, we've had a, a steady increase in GitHub stars uh, up to about 1069 at this point. Uh, on slide 27, we're speaking to the, the known users. Obviously, on the right side, there's lots of non-public users that uh, we're going to face with. Can't just specify by name, but you can see the categories that they're in. But on the left side, we've got plenty of public users. So, you know, whether it's being the default implementation for, uh, for Mesosphere, so all Mesosphere deployments uh, ship Rexray by default for storage primitives, uh, whether it's in the Rancher catalog or, or also available through uh, SOPI.io. Um, from a corporate perspective, we've had plenty of uh, collaborators, whether they're you know, contributing plugins or speaking publicly about using it. Right? There's the list of, of different uh, corporations. Uh, on slide 28, uh, I, I actually opened up a, a thread ahead of time to discuss with the community, like to, to let the Rexray community know that, hey, we're thinking about contributing it to a foundation. And here we had open support from, from other companies that want to collaborate on it if Rexray was inside of a foundation. So you've got Diamante, Mesosphere, Portworx, Rancher, Solidfire, Storage OS. Uh, these are all companies that, uh, that wish to have a foundation so they can collaborate on this CSI implementation. So finishing it up on, on slide 29, uh, I think that you know, storage is a, a critical component to, for cloud native environments. Uh, I think that you know, that being one of the major challenges that I, that I started out with you know, in these cloud native environments kind of addresses that you know, maturity wise, people are thinking about using these, uh, these environments in Kubernetes, et cetera, for more critical workloads. So this, this area is kind of maturing and they're asking tougher questions. So I think we're at a tipping point when it comes to the, you know, expanding the types of applications that are relevant in cloud native. Uh, you know, for storage companies, it's very competitive. And I think that, you know, one of the things that's going to help uh, CSI mature and, and help us get to where we can eject plugins from Kubernetes uh, is that, you know, we need a project that the storage companies can collaborate openly on with open governance. Uh, and I think that's just one of the key things. Um, uh, so with that, I'll wrap it up here and you know, yeah, we're out of time Clint thank you very much for that that was very helpful yeah I have a few quick questions and then uh, want to just ask Chris something so number one just as a, a member of the audience I feel that your explanation of what it is could have been a bit clearer um, and that should happen if you go to the next stage uh, who, who it's for what problem it solves because it shouldn't be something which just solves a problem for the storage vendors um, you know, what's the end user benefit? It just, it's not that it's not there, it's just not super crisp. The uh, other thing is, what are the alternatives? You know, what's the devil's advocate case against Rex Ray? Um, I didn't quite understand that. And again, I've said many times, I'm a bit of a storage idiot, so maybe I'm missing something, but it would just help to be a bit, you know, more simpler and sim simplified in terms of your explanation. Um, other than that, I think, you know, that the, we don't have time to call for a vote to proceed. So I'd ask people to, Put, put questions to Clint on the public list, please, about you know, Rex Ray as a follow-up to today's presentation. And then maybe if we start to see consensus emerging, we could ask it to do a written proposal. Is that okay as a next step? Yeah, yeah that's what you want to do. Yeah, could someone uh, please start a thread? I do have some follow-up uh, questions. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could you could you start the thread up, please? Sorry to be useless. I've got to run as well. Yes. Okay. That's it, everybody. Thanks again. Great. Thank you.